Gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome to another dad battle. Now is anybody, and I mean anybody at all, willing to face our champion? Gentlemen, my son joined the golf team at school, so I bought him an extra pair of socks in case he gets a hole in one. Hole in one. His dad jokes are so effortless. See that? That's why he's the champ. That's nothing. The other day, my daughter said a good Christian dad would buy her a car. So I said, well, a good Christian kid would walk, because that's what Jesus did. Fathers! Listen up, son. Just because God picked your nose doesn't mean you should. <laughs> when you start paying the bills, you can make some of the rules. Come on! Yeah. Yeah. Hold up! Who touched the thermostat? Yeah. yeah! That lawn isn't gonna mow itself. Let me stop what I'm doing and fix your boredom. Hi, Hungry. I'm Dad. <laughs> I love the smell of Home Depot in the morning. Oh, yeah. 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 Just wait till your mother gets home. Ah. Yeah. Oh. 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 What? Pull my finger. Nah. Just rub some dirt on it. Oh. 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 Proud of you. You can do hard things. I love you, no matter what. When God made you, He made something very special. Proudest day of my life is the day you made me a father. I thank God for you every time I get on my knees and pray. And again, who gives this woman? No, no, you look at me. You look at me. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Her mother and I do. <laughs> <laughs>
Should we have a dad off this morning? Maybe not. Happy, happy Father's Day uh, to all of those uh, with us who, uh, who can be, who someone calls you dad. We want to celebrate you today. Uh, there is a small gift on the table in the back. It's the gift of candy bars. So uh, uh, take, uh, yeah, one, one per dad this morning. Want to, uh, want to thank you for, uh, for being you and we celebrate you. Happy Father's Day couple of things to remind you about if you are visiting with us or if you have prayer requests or praises this connect card is your friend use that fill it out drop it in the uh, in the box in the back want to also remind you that we are not very far away from vacation bible school and there are some invitations back there registration is live and uh, if you uh, scan the qr code either in your bulletin or on on these uh, invitations that'll take uh, take you or your friends and neighbors directly to the uh, the place where they can register their kids for VBS. Uh, again, we got about a month, right? Well, a month from yesterday, right? So um, July 15th, uh, there are still a few slots to be filled regarding uh, uh, volunteers, uh, but let's not see it as slots to be filled. Let's see it as places where God is going to use you to impact lives through the week of Vacation Bible School. So uh, make sure that that is on your calendar and that you are uh, looking for ways to invite the people in your life, uh, the kids in your life, to, uh, to VBS this year. want to also remind you that we are collecting crisis care kits, and I still saw some bags back there, which means we haven't distributed, uh, distributed them uh, out to everyone. Uh, we need those back in a, in a few weeks, well, by the end of the month. And so you grab a bag, you buy the stuff that's in the bag, uh, and you put it in the bin. Uh, the bin is just to the left of the, the sanctuary doors as you're going out. And uh, those will all be sent to, uh, to a warehouse. And then uh, as the, there are issues around the world um, where people are in need of care, these kits uh, are shipped to those places and Nazarene Compassionate Ministries distributes them to, uh, to people in need. So we would love for you to be a part of that and uh, we want to be collecting those this month. One more thing to remind you of, and so we told you, so, oh, and, oh, and they're also collecting uh, grocery sacks. Nobody has any plastic grocery sacks, right? We're all, we all have, uh, we've used all those, we don't know. If you've got some, they're collecting them for a, a, a deal they're doing with the kids at District Assembly this summer, and uh, so uh, you can, man, just throw them in that bin along with your crisis care kits, and we will make sure they get to the right place. Um, then also, we have told you a few weeks ago about a competition uh, that uh, has been going on and kind of simmering below the surface uh, through, uh, through the course of the, uh, the, the life of, of the church. Uh, David and Lori, could you come up here, please? Um, we have pitted uh, the boys against the girls or... Um, David against Lori or uh, whatever, but uh, they are, they chose the hottest week of, of many years, I think, to, uh, to do their walk. Uh, Oasis of Hope is, has a, uh, a fundraiser uh, through the, the last half of June um, where, where they're doing it, con uh, encouraging people to, to walk, for, uh, walk for life, and um, David and Lori decided they would not only do that, but they would challenge you to help them do that. David, I haven't tallied things up, but basically David said uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we're going to see who can support Lori in this, see who can support David in this. Some of you were kind of mamby-pamby and put, put your name on both sheets. But, uh, but, uh, but, you know, we really need to pick a side. And No, I'm just kidding. So you've, they're going to do their walk this week if you've not yet signed up to uh, help support one or the other. I mean, really, all the money goes to Oasis of Hope, so I guess we can do that. But uh, bragging rights would go to one or the other. And I, and I believe David's ahead at this point a little bit. A lot. Yeah, just, just for the record, I am winning. Um, <laughs> actually, we, we who have signed my list are winning. Um, I, I kind of resolved to myself that if Lori's ahead, I'll just make up the difference and write my own number in. But then I realized that we share our finances. So you might do the same thing, it doesn't really solve the problem. So looking for your support uh, for us, but really for Oasis. And we are going to be walking in the hottest week of the year. So this is by far the hottest week that's, uh, that's planned uh, coming up. So, um, At 2 a.m. So, uh, <laughs> At 2 a.m., there you go. I'm not about it, she's not. So um, 
I guess the question is, do you take compassion on those who, uh, who make more sacrifice, or do you just celebrate with those of us who love summer and do spend money with us? So think about that. If you haven't uh, done this, we'll have these out there, and uh, we'll take these at the end of the day. Don't give us any money. We'll be, I guess we bill, right? That's what, there's, there's a little there's sheet. A whole, there's sheet. There's a whole different way to send in your money, either mailed in, or you can phone it in, or you can email it in, or you can scan this little fancy thing and do it with your phone. <laughs> there are lots of ways. But. And if you're with us online and you didn't hear any of that because they're not using a microphone, give to Oasis of Hope and uh, send us a little message and we'll let you know how you can do that. And mark Lori Applegate in the little... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, David. No. Uh, so, so I told them they needed to stand at the back after church today holding their clipboards so that you are, you know, truly, truly supporting one or the other. But uh, we want to support ultimately the, uh, the, the things that Oasis of Hope supports, uh, issues of, of life. And uh, so we, we are uh, strong supporters of them and the work that they do. So thank you guys. And they'll be at the, at the back. Let's stand together as we, um, as we prepare to worship today. Psalm 101 starts out this way. I will sing of your love and justice. To you, Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When, can, when will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. In other words, as we come into the house of the Lord, as we worship, we worship with, uh, uh, it is a great opportunity to make sure that we are worshiping with, with clear, pure hearts and we are allowing God's grace to impact us. Let's, uh, let's worship him as we celebrate who he is and the, uh, the holiness that he provides for us. Of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus I sing all that you've done for me who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. 
worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take I sing for all that you've done for me. We sing to the King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation is again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfires in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Let's sing that again. Come set Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, increase in us, we pray. Unveil, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very soul. Go. Are your church we are your church 
and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We may revive this earth. Build your, build your
may be seated. Let's pray together. Father God, it is in the beautiful, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus that we pray this morning. We are in awe of your presence, of your power, of your grace, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your authority. Lord, I pray that this time that we have together today can, can help reset some things in our lives that maybe uh, have gotten out of whack throughout the week. I pray that we can reset and know within our souls that you are the supreme authority of our lives. 
and if there is no other. I pray that you will help us to rely on you first and foremost for, for anything and everything in our lives. We thank you that you love us and that, that you have created us and that you've designed us specifically and that you have things for us to, to be and things for us to do. I pray, Lord, that you would al align our, our lives with, with the things of God. Lord, if that means that we need to say no to some things this morning, if we need to ask forgiveness for some things this morning, Lord, I pray that you would, you would nudge us in those directions, that you would convict, and at the same time that that conviction flows in, that your great mercy and love flows into our souls, so that we can know that you have promised to forgive and to restore. Lord, I pray for your encouragement and for your, uh, your healing touch on the, the, uh, the folks who are going through physical infirmities, Lord. I think of those who are recovering from surgery and uh, different stages, Lord, and we just pray for your hand of healing and, and uh, for your presence in, in, in those folks' lives. We pray for those that we know and love who are going through difficult circumstances, and, and even now all across this room, we're thinking of those people and we're lifting their, their needs to you, and we pray that you would you would bring your, uh, your, your touch in those situations. Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would use our lives, that you would use this church to be a, a beacon of light and life and hope in the lives of the people of this community. I pray, Lord, that you would lead us to the, the people that you've, uh, you've placed in our lives, that, that there would be anointed conversations that take place and, uh, this week, that we know that you are leading us in those situations. I pray that you would, uh, you would build uh, relationships so that, uh, so that we can speak your truth and your love in, in those lives. Lord, we pray for, uh, for a, a revival in the hearts, uh, not only of, of our people, Lord, but in this community, that, that you would be moving and working and, and preparing people's hearts and lives for, for times when we encounter them and can share your love and, and draw them to you, Lord. We pray for, for your transformation to take place. We thank you for the, the many Christian churches around our community and the impact that, that, uh, that all of these churches are having on the community where we live. Lord, we pray truly that your kingdom would come in this world, that your will would be done in this earth. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to know uh, individually and as a church how we, can, how we can partner with you, how we can be used uh, to acknowledge that, that uh, you are moving and working and bringing your kingdom through us. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together, and, and as we worship you, and as we celebrate you, and as we open your word, Lord, I pray that, that you would open our hearts to be res responsive and receptive to what you have to say to us today. We commit ourselves fresh and new to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's time for Hope Squadron. Our kids are uh, heading out. And then we'll jump into the sermon. Let's do that. This election, your choice couldn't be more important. Our candidate is in flattering lighting and full bright color. Their candidate is in grainy high contrast black and white. Spotted through a telephoto lens from behind a bush. Coming back from God only knows where. Our guy points at the horizon and holds a baby. Their guy doesn't have a baby. Their guy has a golf club. The voiceover for our guy is calm, measured, bright. Their guy gets the lower register. And sometimes we slow down. Our guy has clean headlines and the beautiful lens flare America needs. Here's a scary graph over a photo of their guy awkwardly laughing. Snap zoom. Do you want a snap zoom like that in office? Here's a photo of our guy saluting military veterans. Jump cuts, flashes, static, aggressive colors. You can't trust a guy with graphics like this. Our guy gets stock footage of sunrises and an American flag. Their guy's flag is upside down and on fire. Intercut with overdue bills, war, and a crying baby. 
Our guy gets doctors and astronauts and stimulus checks. Flatline, an eagle, hurricane, the Statue of Liberty, crime scene tape, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, a building, atomic bomb. This election, the choice is yours. Their guy or our guy. Inspiring slogan. You've seen that ad a thousand times, right? All, uh, these days, so many, uh, so many ways to consume media. It's not just, uh, you know, used to be on TV and they'd break in with the commercials during the election se season. But now you get the ads on your phone and on your email and on social media. And, and uh, man, some of them are even popping up when you're playing Candy Crush, right? They're just, they're just everywhere all the time. And in this presidential election year, things are heating up and we're still, what, are we, five months away from election day, right? I remember my first um, foray into participating in the political process. I have a distinct memory of walking with my mother on election day, the one block down our street to Glenmont Elementary School. I, man, I couldn't have been more than four, I don't think. I think my brother was at school and I wasn't, so I had to go with my mom and, and we, uh, we, we walked uh, came in through the, uh, uh, the, the playground there and then walked up and we waited in line and as we did I could see into the gym and I could see these big green machines stationed throughout the gym in that elementary school. Anybody, uh, anybody remember these machines? A couple of you are, are as old as me. That's good. Um, of course I was four at the time. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm not... not you know, casting it, just letting you know. But uh, anyway, my, so my mom gets checked in. Uh, we're, we're directed to one of these big metal contraptions. And uh, when we got there, my mom asked if I wanted to help. And I thought, yes, yes, I want to help, of course. So she put my hand on this big lever and we moved it over. And I thought, I voted, right? Well, all I did was move that curtain close. See the curtain up there? The, the thing, it, it closes behind you. And then they got all the little metal things. Uh, and, and you got to move the things. And, and it makes big noises. and all the, But nobody can see because you got the... Now, I was four, so I could see underneath the, the curtain and, and could look around during this. But uh, so my mind, it didn't take very long. You know, click, 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 all the things uh, and uh, switches. And then we together move that curtain back, uh, move that lever back. And the curtain slid out. And uh, we were... We were on our way. I didn't, I didn't personally vote that day, but I like to think that that was my first step in participating in the democratic system of our country. Now, voting technology has changed a little bit over, uh, over the years, uh, 50 years since then, I guess. Um, even, I mean, even over the few years, I don't know, 10 or 12 years that we've been a polling place here uh, at our church, the machines they bring in have changed like two or three times. They have different, uh, newer technology, all these things. But the technology may change, but the, but the principle is still the same, right? We live in a democracy where we have the civic privilege to participate in electing leaders and either supporting or opposing issues. Not every nation has that privilege. Unfortunately, more and more people are turned off by the notion of participating in that process. If we just mention the word politics, usually there's a, a negative response, right? Uh, it, we, we have the notion that most politicians are liars and crooks and they're out for money and power and your vote. But we're all affected to some extent by, by the government of the, the nation where we live and the actions of our politicians. So, so the, the question today is how should we as Christians deal with politics? Now I know, I'm well aware, that I'm probably on shaky ground this morning. I know that there are two things that people should not talk about in, in groups one is religion, and the other is politics. Now, every week, we're on religion, right? I'm already, I'm already ready to be on, uh, already used to being on shaky ground, because I'm always talking about religion, right? But, but uh, now we're wading into politics, and even worse, maybe the most contro controversial thing is all, uh, of all is mixing religion and politics, right? But, but, but part of what that means, part of what it means to follow Jesus is that my spiritual life has an influence on every aspect of my life. 
It's not just this little cubby hole that this is my spiritual life and this is my home life and this is my work life and this is my political life, but my, my relationship with Jesus has an influence on every other part of my life, including my political involvement. My allegiance to Jesus mixes with all other aspects of my life. So, so I, I guess I'm saying from the get-go that I believe that religion and politics should mix. We, we, we tend to form our identity around all sorts of things these days. Uh, one of which seems to be the, the political party that we align with. Uh, which candidate we support. We kind of, oh, I'm there and I'm in this camp and we're, and this is us and this is kind of my identity. And that's the, them and they're over and that's their, I, and, and we, kind of, we kind of form our identity around, we define ourselves uh, or, or we group up according to who we vote for, or what issues we support or what issues we're against. And, and, and you know, a lot of, we, we need to make those decisions, well-informed decisions, but, but our identity should be rooted primarily in Jesus and our relationship with him. I, I'm, I'm a Christian who also lives in the United States, right? I, I'm a Christ follower who loves a great burger, my identity, okay, I'm a burger lover, but before that, anyway, I, I love a great burger. I'm, I'm not a fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I follow soccer. I, I run to stay in shape. Those are all, I mean, I, I follow Jesus and I also voted for fill in the blank, right? Uh, all those things are fine and all those things are part of who we are. But first and foremost, above any and every other thing, I am a follower of Jesus. All of those decisions and preferences that, uh, that uh, I've made in my life can turn into division and conflict, if I let it, right? Because there's always somebody on the other side, so to speak. I, and some are more controversial than others. I mean, although they, they could cause problems, if you wear a Browns journey, jersey in downtown Pittsburgh, you know, let me know how that's going for you, right? Or uh, if you bring up soccer to a group of football players, see if there might be a little bullying going on. I think I can probably testify personal, personal experience. Not too many uh, non-runners give me a whole lot of grief about being a runner. They just don't understand it. Some of them quote this verse to me. The wicked run away when no one is chasing them. Uh, so they're accusing me of, uh, of being wicked. I, guess. I mean, it's controversial stuff, right? The, the way that we identify ourselves, the way that we find our identity uh, at times, it can be controversial. It can be polarizing. But uh, whether I run or not is not near as polarizing as what it seems uh, declaring who I support in the next election. Or I mean, it seems like a lot of times this is scary stuff to even talk about anymore, right? Whether, whether I'm on social media or at dinner with friends or, or wherever I find myself, political views can isolate and offend. So we have to handle this well. As followers of Jesus, we can't just ignore it or cubbyhole it into a certain segment of life. But we have to handle it well. So at the end of the day today, despite the title on the top of your outline, there on the back of your bulletin, I will not be telling you who to vote for <laughs> in the upcoming presidential election. If that's what you came for, you'll be disappointed. I'm sorry. Probably you've been on the edge of your seat going, boy, where's he going with this? So relax a little bit. We're good. We're having a good time, right? Hopefully, we're going to discover a little bit about what God says about government and politics and what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a good citizen wherever we live. I, I think we'll find some principles that we can live by as we navigate the political terrain of the day. Maybe if I was going to give you just one point today in the sermon, uh, it would be this. Pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. Pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. Of God. When, when Jesus preached and taught on this earth, many people thought that he had come to establish an earthly kingdom, right? They were fed up with being ruled by Rome. They assumed that the Messiah, their Savior, Jesus, was going to physically reign as king. They, were, they thought he was going to lead the charge as they overthrew the Romans and, and took charge. Many were ready to fight in order to see that happen. But Jesus told them differently. Uh, when he's, he's talking with Pilate in John 18, 36, uh, he's, he tells him, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. 
If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. When we follow Jesus, we are citizens of his kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. It is not of this world. Another way of saying it, the Apostle Paul in, in Philippians 3.20 uh, says that we are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about the political landscape or that we shouldn't be involved in, in politics in some way. But we need to have a proper perspective. You are first and foremost a citizen of heaven and that must define us as followers of Jesus before any other political leanings defi define us. Now, I know that's not new to you, and, and probably you're nodding along and saying, yeah, that's, that's true, I need to be a citizen of heaven, I pledge allegiance to, to the kingdom of God. But are we really living like that? Or do we get all hot and bothered by the politics of the day? <laughs> I, maybe a good way to, to answer that is, uh, which do you think about more? The advance of God's kingdom or the direction our country's going? Because usually we're tied up on that second one and maybe thinking just a little bit about the first. Or, or what do you discuss more with people? What God is up to or what the latest senator or presidential candidate is up to or down to? In our conversations, in our actions, it should be obvious that we are not just citizens of the United States of America, but that we are citizens of heaven, first and foremost, far above any political leanings. I think in order for that to take place, a few things need to be settled in our minds as if we're going to live as citizens of, of God's kingdom. The first goes right along with what I said. We're pledging allegiance to the, the kingdom of God. Uh, another way of, of thinking about that is recognizing that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. I'm not just making it up. It's all through scripture. Revelation 1.5, grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. Ephesians 1, 21 and 22. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Not only in this world but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ. And has made him head over all things for the benefit of of the church. Philippians 2, therefore God elevated him, Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess, confess declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 19, 6, on his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings, and Lord of all lords. I guess in, in America we'd say that Jesus is the president of all presidents, right? He is, has the uh, ultimate authority even over the Supreme Court. That he is greater than any lawmaker on Capitol Hill. Uh, God, Jesus, God in Jesus is the king over all kings. The leader over all leaders. The Lord of all lords. We have to live like that. We have to believe that. <laughs> Jesus is is the king of kings and we have to live for his kingdom first. That's who Jesus is. If we're going to live as, as, uh, as citizens of, of his kingdom, if we're going to live as citizens of heaven, then he is king of kings and lord of lords. We've got to get that straight. We also have to recognize our place in all of this. The first is that we are exiles. 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles... To abstain from sin, sinful desires which wage war against your soul. God's people throughout history. Uh, they, God's people have a history of being foreigners and, and exiles. The, uh, I, I mentioned a minute ago the Jews were under the authority of Rome. They, there was, uh, they, they were not in charge there. They, they, had, uh, they, they were living uh, um, in, in, uh, in essence in exile. Though they were in their, uh, their, their country they were ruled by another 
In the Old Testament, uh, there, there are a uh, long history of, of the people being banished from their land, living in exile in the lands of other governments. And today, we are, as citizens of heaven, living in exile on this earth to an extent. We are in this world, but not of this world. Our values and our principles come from God. In Israel's day, they were living in exile in Babylon. And uh, the prophet Jeremiah, prompted by God, wrote a letter to them. These exiles that have been taken from their land and now they're living in, in, uh, in Babylon. And they're, they're crying out and saying, God, restore us back to our land. Restore us back. And, and, and Jeremiah wrote them a letter and wrote some things that were maybe a little bit uh, unexpected. Jeremiah 29, 7. Uh, God says through the prophet Jeremiah, seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which I I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. He didn't say, hang on, I'm coming, you're going you're gonna to get, get uh, ushered back out of there real quick. He said, no, you know what? You're going to be there a while. So you need to do some things in order to seek the peace and prosperity of the place where you are. If we are citizens of heaven, we are in exile living in this earth. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to handle that? Well, we need to pray for the peace and prosperity of, the, of our country and our world. Pray to the Lord. That's, uh, that, that's one big thing that, uh, that, that Jeremiah tells these people to do. Pray to the Lord. Are you praying for our country? Do you pray for our leaders? When was the last time that you prayed for God's favor on the, on, on the leaders of our country, even if, God forbid, you didn't vote for them? Paul says the same thing in 1 Timothy 2. You might say, oh, that was an Old Testament thing. Well, here's a New Testament thing. Of course, it's all inspired by God. That's another sermon. But uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We are, we are exiles. We are in this world, but not of this world. What, what do we need to do as, as part of, what is one of our primary responsibilities as an exile living in this world? Pray for the peace and prosperity of the place where we live. Another thing we need to do is that we need to be good citizens. We need to live under, under the authorities that, that have been established. Romans 13, verses 1 through 6. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Maybe we need to keep in mind here as we're reading this. This is, this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Romans during the, uh, uh, the, the rule of Nero... Um, I don't know if you've, uh, you're up on your, your Roman uh, history, but Nero wasn't exactly the most uh, Christian holy guy. Uh, he was burning Christians at the stake. He was, he was uh, maybe a little bit insane, maybe a lot insane. A lot. This is the, author, the authorities that, that Paul is writing about. Let, and he says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you'll be commended. The one who is in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of people uh, of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Now, why did he have to throw in that thing about taxes, right? Come on, what, what, what are we doing here? Now, re representing God well in the place where he has put us means that we're submitting to and obeying the authorities, over, even if that means paying our taxes, right? 
Of course, the, the, if laws and practices, uh, the, the laws of the land go against the laws of God, we're ultimately subject to him. We're, we're pledging allegiance to his kingdom first, right? In Acts 5.29, it says Peter and the other apostles uh, said we must obey God rather than human beings. So we, we've got to keep that in mind as well. But as exiles living where we live, whether that's this country or anywhere else in the world, we are part of the kingdom of God. We are citizens of heaven. We're living in exile. We pray for the, the peace and prosperity of the place where we live, and we submit to and obey the laws of the land as good and upright citizens. We're, we're part of this, uh, the, we're, we're in this world, but not of this world. Another way to look at that, another way that scripture uh, uh, describes it, not just that we're exiles, but there's also a sense that we are ambassadors, right? And that puts it in a little bit of a different context. 2 Corinthians 5.20 we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are ambassadors of God. An ambassador is someone who lives in a country that's, that's not their home, but they represent the interests of the homeland, right? An ambassador speaks on behalf of their country, builds relationships with people in order to promote goodwill in relation to their relationship with the home country, helps ease tensions that might arise between the two countries. It's also important to recognize that it's a temporary assignment. At some point, uh, an ambassador is called back home. All of those things are important as we think about what it means to be ambassadors for Christ. Maybe you recognize the name George Shultz. George Shultz was Secretary of State during the uh, Ronald Reagan presidency. Uh, and when newly elected ambassadors were, uh, uh, were, were appointed, or, or uh, yeah, appointed, uh, they would interview with the Secretary of State, George Shultz. And, and part of that interview was always a little bit of a test. George Shultz would, would point them over to a, a, a large globe that he had in his office. He, he said, go over to that globe and prove to me that you can identify your country. And so they'd go over and they'd spin the globe and they'd put their finger on the country uh, to which they had been uh, appointed, right, to represent the U.S. U.S. in that country. When George Shultz's old friend and uh, uh, former Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield was appointed as an ambassador to Japan, Shultz put him to the test too. And uh, he told him to go over to the globe and, and uh, identify his country. And so Mike Mansfield went over and spun the globe, but he bypassed Japan completely and stopped it dead on the United States of America. And he said, Mr. Secretary, that's my country. In an interview years later, Secretary George Schultz recounted that story and then he said this. He said, I've told that story subsequently to all the ambassadors going out. Never forget you're over there in that country, but your country is the United States. You you're there to represent us. Take care of our interests and never forget it that you're representing the best country in the world. Okay, well that's United States politics, but let's think about how that fits into the realm of us being ambassadors of Christ. We represent him. We are citizens of heaven. We're promoting God's will and God's agenda. Uh, we, are, we are promoting, uh, the, we, we are lifting up uh, the, the things and principles of, of God. We're seeking to, to br build a bridge between the people of this world and the God whom we serve, the, our, our homeland. We're not at home. We belong to another kingdom. And it's a temporary assignment. I don't know if you realized it, but at some point you're going to be called back home again. We belong to another kingdom, and Jesus is our king. Is he your king? Are you living first for his kingdom? If you are, then I think there are a few things that, we'll, that, that, that you'll be doing... Um, a few things that will characterize your life, especially in this realm of politics. First is that you're going to trust in God's power, not in politics. 
There, there have been times in my life that I've leaned toward or even promoted certain candidates and, and uh, I've been known uh, at times to listen to talk radio and to read blogs and to watch news channels and, and I've been convinced that a certain person just had to win and it was going to be catastrophic if they lost. And there have been times in my short life when my candidate has lost and the world didn't fall apart and my life continued on and I still had meaningful relationships and I still had the opportunities to make spiritual, help people make spiritual progress and I grew and matured and it wasn't the end of the world. Now there, there will be an end of the world. But no earthly politician is ever going to usher it in. God will usher it in in his time, in his way, and we can trust him. The, the political tactics of the day, uh, I, I believe, are, if, uh, I don't think I'm uh, uh, making it up, they're, they're rooted in division and fear, right? If you've watched anything, if you've had any uh, uh, news channels on or anything, it doesn't matter which way you lean. If you're watching Fox News or CNN, either way, they're, they're promo or watching any of these ads, like they're, they're promoting division and fear. We're right, they're wrong, this is why. Uh, you need to be so afraid of them, and so we need your vote. But fear and division, I don't know. The only place that I see fear and division in Scripture is not the kingdom of God. It's not, they're not kingdom of God principles. I mean, throughout Scripture, over and over and over again, do not fear, don't be afraid, do not fear. The, 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 the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, and, and that's where our fear lies, our reverence. It's, it's, not, about, it's not about being afraid of what's going to happen. Oh, my goodness, I hope that, oh, I've got to... And division, I mean... What did Jesus pray for over and over and over again? That we would be one, that his followers would be unified. Uh, I mean, we're not doing a great job at it. Uh, we see all the different, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, limbs of the, uh, the, the, the family tree of the body of Christ. But, but, but we, we, Christ's desire is that we'd be unified, that we'd be one, that we'd be working together to build his kingdom because we're all citizens of heaven. <laughs> Division and, uh, and, and fear have no place in the kingdom of God. And so we have, to, we have to realize that for what it is. Division and fear are weapons of the evil one. They are not weapons of, of God. And, and, and so maybe it means that, that at some point we turn off the TV. Or we log out of social media. Or, or we, I don't know, start living with the joy and hope that God provides because we're part of the kingdom of God. Stop fretting over what's going to happen next or who's going to be uh, in, in, uh, in, in authority or, or get voted in here. Or this. And stop fretting about all of that. And trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords. To work it out. He can handle things. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be informed. I, I, I'm not suggesting that we stick our heads in the sand. And, and you don't know about or participate in the issues of the day. We have to stand up for kingdom issues. You just need to know that the systems that we're, we're operating in are flawed. And ultimately we're relying on, on Jesus and his kingdom. In, in his recent book, uh, Live No Lies, John Mark Comer lays out five distinctive features of the early church. Uh, and, and he says that these five things uh, caused the Christians of, the, of that day in the early church to stand out uh, uh, against the culture of the, the Roman Empire in the, in the first three centuries. There were five things that, that, that the church did. The, the first was that the church was ethnically an ethnically diverse group and gave value and dignity to people of various cultural backgrounds. The second thing, the church was an economically diverse group and embraced and assisted those who were poor and outcast. The third, the church strongly opposed the practices of infanticide and abortion, which were, were uh, prevalent of that day in, in the Roman, uh, Roman rule, places where Romans rule. The church believed that God was called, had called them to sexual purity and to honor marriage, and, which was a radical concept in the, in the culture of that day as well. And the fifth thing that he says that, that uh, characterized the church of that day was that they promoted nonviolence, both personally and politically. 
Now, John Comer says in that book that if the church of today re-embraced those five positions with our current two-party system, uh, it would, the, the first two would put us at odds with the conservatives, and the second two would put us at odds with the liberals, and the last one uh, would put us at odds with everybody, right? But it's exactly because they were operating outside of the political systems of the day that the church stood out as a witness for God. Maybe you know the name uh, Pastor Tim Keller recently uh, passed away, was a well-known pastor and author, uh, pastor to church uh, uh, in, um, in New York City for years. New York Times interviewed him uh, not so long before his death, and, and they asked the question, how do Christians fit into the two-party system? And Keller said, they don't. <laughs> He went on to talk about being aware of the dangers of, quote, what he called package deal politics. We just sign up for allegiance to a certain party and, 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 uh, and that's that. And, and one line, as I listened to a, a message that, that Pastor Tim Keller preached, one line jumped out at me. He said, sure, be involved in politics if you want. But don't put your hope there. The next few months are going to certainly be chaotic in the political landscape. There are bound to be all sorts of newsworthy things that are going to happen and we'll be tempted to get anxious or angry or even divisive. But before you do any of that, let me encourage you to pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. To pledge your allegiance first and foremost to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is over all things and we can trust him. We are first and foremost citizens of heaven. So I encourage you to live like exiles and ambassadors during the short time that we have living in this world. I would encourage you to stand. Our worship team's going to come and we're going to sing all about Jesus and his kingdom. And let's, let's pray as we prepare to do that. Gracious Father God, we pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done. We pray for wisdom to know how we uh, can, uh, can and should operate as, as your ambassadors living, living in this world that we are not of, but, uh, but we are still here. We pray that you would help us to have an influence, your influence, in the, in the culture where we live. Help us to be involved in, in the things that you lead us to be involved in so that, most of all, we can represent you well. That we can stand up for the things that, that, uh, uh, that, that you would stand up for. That we can, we can uh, uh, champion the cause of those that, that need to be championed. That you'll help us to stand for, for your truth and your love and for your grace. And most of all, Lord, I pray that we can put our hope in you. That you are our King and our Lord. And we are under your authority. Father God, we, we worship you. Amen. A thousand generations falling down in worship sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy.
highest your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all Jesus your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever hear your people sing hear your people sing Father God, we acknowledge that we are under your authority today. We pray for your guidance as we walk through what seems to be uh, minefields all the time, especially in politics. Lord, I pray that you will govern over the words that we say, that you will govern over the relationships that we have, you will govern over the allegiances that we make, that you will govern over the, the social media posts that we post. Lord, I pray that you will, it will be obvious to all that we are first and foremost citizens of heaven under the authority of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are your ambassadors. I pray that you'll help us even this week and in the days ahead in a, in a political election year that you will enable us to represent you well in the world where we live. In Jesus' name, amen.